So without further ado, let me now introduce our speaker, Professor Alex Proust. Professor Proust is Professor of Philosophy and Director of Graduate Studies at Baylor University. He has two doctorates, one in philosophy from the University of Pittsburgh and the other in mathematics from the University of British Columbia. He has published numerous books and articles in philosophy and mathematics, which include the recent Infinity, Causation, and Paradox, as well as Necessary Existence. Please join me in welcoming Professor Proust. OK, thank you. It's a great pleasure to be here. Um, so when I was a math grad student, I spent like a summer thinking a little bit about philosophy of math and decided it was all kind of garbage and, and pointless. Um, and then sort of came back to that like maybe 15 years later and decided, no, this is not garbage. This is actually really interesting and difficult. So I, I'm going to start by sketching something what I think of as the mystery of mathematics and several aspects of it. Um, then try to sketch how uh, three figures in the Christian tradition, Augustine, Aquinas, and Galileo, uh, may provide a solution to, uh, to those mysteries or at least allow us to make some progress on it. So let me start with the puzzles. So there's sort of two things about mathematics that are striking. One is, is kind of obvious. If we look at the areas of human discovery, mathematics is where we are most certain. We have proof, right? I mean, this is way better than you know, what we have anywhere else. I mean, maybe sometimes phys physicists prove things, but even there, it, it tends to be a little bit more hand wavy. Um, so we're really sure that mathematics tells us the truth, but we don't know at all what it means. It tells us all sorts of things, but what those things mean, I think, is really mysterious. Right? So, you know, there are other areas, you know, geology, chemistry, non-fundamental physics, where we know quite a lot, we know what we're talking about, but we're not quite sure that our theories are actually true. I mean, we have some confidence, but uh, not, that, not nearly as much as mathematics. Um, ancient mathematics stands roughly unchanged with maybe occasionally we see, yeah, they left out some assumption, but we can, with minor fixes, most of ancient mathematics just stands. Uh, ancient geology, biology, chemistry, and physics, by and large, do not stand. They're by and large gone. So, you know, like the ancient Greeks proved that there are infinitely many prime numbers. And, you know, that proof stands. And uh, it's true, and uh, we know it's true, and we know it's true for pretty much the same reason that they had for thinking it's true. But even though it's no, we know it's true, there are infinitely many prime numbers, we don't have much of an idea of what numbers are. So there are infinitely many of them, and infinitely many of those are prime, but what a number is, is of course a mystery. So we've got like kind of an uncontroversial near certainty, maybe even complete certainty, combined with a deep mystery as to what the meaning of mathematics is. And in addition to sort of this mystery of what it means, there's this puzzle that it is extremely useful. It's also quite difficult, which may actually be somewhat in uh, interesting or not philosophically, we'll see. So what do people say about this? Well, there's sort of two kinds of, two general uh, sort of radically opposed approaches to thinking about mathematics if you're a philosopher. Um, and there are things sort of more in between. So one, on one extreme is what people call Platonism. So Plato, the philosopher, thought that we had this physical world all around us of changing stuff, but we decided was there, there's like a world of forms, which contains things like uh, goodness and beauty and circularity and squareness and has all these things sort of in their perfect form. The physical world has only imperfection. There are no circles, really, in the, in the world, right? There's just stuff like that, more or less like that, that are, are a little bit like circles, but aren't really circles. There are no triangles. There are no lines in the, in the physical world. There's only approximations to the stuff in the Platonic world. And in the Platonic world, on the other hand, we can have all this kind of mathematical beauty, some of which Plato thought, knew about, some of it which he didn't. You can have numbers, circles, lines, sets, categories, uh, division rings, all sorts of cool stuff. Um, so that's one kind of approach. There's this, like this platonic world, and this is the real, really real stuff. 
But then there's like three puzzles about this. First, what are these weird things? They're not physical things. What are they? What, what, where, what are these things? Secondly, we're evolved apes. How do we evolved apes get in touch with those things? Like our senses can't sense them. How can we get access? How is it that we actually get access to these uh, strange uh, platonic entities? Um, and uh, lastly, uh, why is it that these uh, weird, uh, the, these platonic perfect things, uh, unchanging uh, things that, that give us these mathematical truths, why is it that they're so useful in the physical world? Why is it like you can uh, do engineering based on them, uh, which is in the physical world and deals with changing uh, and imperfect stuff? How is it that it, it's useful? So this is one. This is sort of one extreme, right, the Platonism. The other view is, a deflation, is what people call deflationary theories. So a deflationary theory of mathematics tries to make mathematics less mysterious and more accessible to evolved apes. So one kind of theory that uh, people tried is logicism. So this is the idea that mathematics, it's not about numbers or sets or division rings or things like that. It's the study of what you can, what you can prove from axioms. So just a study of logical consequence, what you can prove from axioms. It doesn't, mathematics doesn't care whether the axioms are true or false. Um, but, you know, when the axioms are satisfied, or at least approximately satisfied in the physical world, then you can expect that the consequences are also going to be satisfied or approximately satisfied. Um, logicism, I think, kind of died. It died in the first half of the 20th century, um, and part, largely, I think, because of Kurt Gödel's uh, incompleteness theorems, which basically show that this concept of what can be proved or what logically follows has pretty much all of the same mysteriousness that, that uh, like ordinary mathematics of numbers does. I mean, when you talk about what can be proved, that's not actually the same as talking about what is proved. That's talking about like what there is an abstract proof of. Proofs are sort of considered abstract objects and they're themselves mathematical objects according to Gödel. And you have kind of come to realize this, that proofs are themselves mathematical objects that are very much like numbers. Um, so at least abstract proofs. So logicism ended up failing on, on pretty technical grounds. And we can talk about that in the discussion if need be. Another kind of view is mind-dependent views. Kind of an extreme version is that like mathematical entities are fictions. Like they're like, so maybe numbers are like fictional characters, like Sherlock Holmes. Um, and you can have, you know, that makes it sound like you would get to just make it up, but not completely. Like you don't get to make up whatever you like about Sherlock Holmes. There's some truths about him. He's a, he's a fine detective and, and an odd guy. Um, so you can, there's some truth there, but it's still really puzzling. If they're just these fictional characters, uh, or like fictional characters, why is it that it's so useful to our world? Like we don't like, uh, learn how to do things uh, in engineering by studying uh, science fiction. But we do by studying mathematics. So I think thinking that mathematics is radically dependent on our minds makes it really hard to see why it's useful for our world. It might make it, see, make it clear why it's fun, but not why it's useful. Mathematics is also beautiful. So I th thought a little bit, you know, we philosophers sort of like to classify things. So I thought there's like three kinds of beauty of mathematics, I thought. Um, one kind of beauty is you've got like beautiful mathematical objects typically generated by simple rules. Another kind of thing, beauty of mathematics is uh, beautiful mathematical facts. I think it's kind of really beautiful that in Euclidean geometry, the angles in a triangle add up to 180 degrees or that every natural number can be uniquely written as a product of primes, or amazing ancient fact that there are only five platonic solids. These are lovely things, or that there aren't any finite non-commutative division rings. Um, beautiful mathematical facts. And not everybody appreciates them. <laughs> the, the beautiful mathematical objects, the ones that are sort of graphically uh, visualizable, um, most people appreciate. 
Uh, not, uh, but then there are some that are not visualizable, like that Lee group I listed. Um, but these ones, very, very, sometimes it can be brought to see, a lot of people can be brought to see that they're cool, but they're, they're less sort of obviously beautiful. And then there's like beautiful mathematical proofs too, right? Like this, a, the ancient proof that all, there's an infinite number of prime numbers is it's a beautiful, elegant, brief reductio ad absurdum. Um, so we've got like three different kinds of beauty in math. Okay, and that's also puzzling, right? Why, why is mathematics beautiful? I mean, uh, what, what, what explains this beauty here? Well, one kind of solution is subjectivism about beauty. You might say, okay, well, beauty is in the eye of the beholder. It's a common thing, right? Beauty is not something to be disputed about. Beauty is not something objective. Um, beauty is purely subjective. I think that's false. Um, <laughs> There are two works of art here, um, one by me and one by somebody else. <laughs> and you can tell that, uh, that whoever did this is the superior artist, right? <laughs> it's objectively clearly true, right? <laughs> so yeah, it's obviously there's like objective, you know, anybody who, who, do, who does, a, who think, no, seriously, like anybody who thinks this is the, this could, that it's merely subjective that this is worse than this, I just don't know what, to, what more to say. I mean, this is like a, this is, maybe it's not like a mathematical proof, but it's like an argument by picture, okay. Um, but suppose it's true, suppose it's even is true that, that beauty is in the eye of the beholder, that it's subjective. It's still, here's a different kind of puzzle. Why did we evolve to find mathematics beautiful? Mathematical beauty was not perceived by ancient forebears. Like there are some theories as to how the perception of beauty evolved. I think often it has to do with uh, something like mates, you know, that uh, physical beauty of a certain kind correlates with health and health correlates with good genes and hence correlates with having good offspring. So yeah, physical beauty uh, of human being, of fellow human beings might make some sense to have a, a perception of it evolve. But mathematical beauty doesn't seem at all to be helpful in at least sort of over much of human evolutionary history um, because they just didn't have the math, the beautiful math back then to appreciate. So perceiving this mathematical beauty would not help you gain a mate. Whether it helps gain a mate these days is, uh, is an empirical question that maybe some of you are trying to get answered, <laughs> but this talk will not answer it. So it's at best, I think, evolutionarily, what people call a spandrel, where a spandrel is like um, uh, you, have some, uh, you have the evolution of some features of uh, an organism that are helpful for basically uh, 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 passing on genes. And then as a sort of side effect of that, we get uh, some other thing coming out. So maybe the perception of beauty could be some kind of a side effect, uh, the perception of mathematical beauty, some kind of side effect of other things, but it's not clear what, what, it, what those other things are, how that would work. Also, if it's a spandrel, just something just kind of minor, just completely subjective and a side effect, then the beauty of mathematics becomes basically a meaningless pleasure because it's just completely subjective, just kind of weird side effect that it's kind of like the, some weird side effect that you know you could imagine some critter where you you press them here and do some weird side effect they feel some intense pleasure. Um, we see some mathematics and those of us who like mathematics feel pleasure there. It seems like kind of like drugs. It doesn't seem to have much meaning. It seems pointless. But mathematics doesn't seem pointless in this way. The mathematical beauty, the pursuit of it seems like really worthwhile. Besides, if the beauty of mathematics is all subjective, why is beautiful mathematics useful? So let's get to talk a little bit about this usefulness. So since the t this is like, uh, I think, being one of the big innovations if, of Copernicus is a focus that on beautiful mathematical theories, right? So, so before Copernicus, we had like these theories that were pretty good at predicting uh, how the, how the uh, planets appeared to move in the sky. 
And the story was that, well, there's the Earth in the center of the universe, and around the Earth, there are these, uh, the planets kind of move in circles, but they don't move in circles around the Earth exactly. They move in circles that orbit other circles that orbit other circles that orbit these circles. Because if you just suppose they moved in circles around the Earth, it wouldn't fit with what we actually observe in the sky. So you had to posit like a multiplicity of circles around circles around circles, which we call, which they called epicycles. And this was really messy theory. Very good, though, actually, for predicting uh, where the planets are going to be in the sky on a given time, when eclipses are going to happen. It actually worked as, a, as an empirical theory. And for those of us who know math, you know that you can approximate uh, any kind of uh, fairly periodic function quite well by a Fourier series. And that's basically what was happening when they were doing these epicycles. They were approximating things with a Fourier series. It worked great, but it was a really complicated mathematical theory. And Copernicus found, hey, you know, I can get a pretty good approximation just by supposing that things move much more simply in circles directly around the sun. And this is much simpler. Now, it actually didn't work completely because he still needed some epicycles to fit the data because, in fact, we know that uh, things don't move around the sun in circles. They move in ellipses. And he, 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 he'd, he was so focused on the simplicity that he preferred circles but, and, it, and took Kepler to think of ellipses. But still, the point was it's, it's a lot simpler to go this way. And this going for the simpler theory led to the truth. It led to Kepler's refinement where it's ellipses. It led to uh, Newton's discovery of uh, the theory of gravitation. And then later, you know, sort of after some centuries to Einstein's uh, stuff. So elegant and simple mathematical theories rule physics. Uh, like great theories are, can be put in simple ways. Um, and Copernicus is where we have the beginning of this. Galileo then expands on this idea. Uh, simpler theories are n never, maybe almost never, but I actually think ne probably never, the best fit to the data. So, you know, suppose this is your data. You have these little, uh, you, you, you gather very little data, you gather five data points. Um, uh, there are two theories that, fit these data, that you can use to fit these data points. A very simple linear theory that y equals x in this case. This is not a bad fit. Um, or this polynomial, this fourth degree polynomial. This fourth degree polynomial fits these data points perfectly. This line fits them imperfectly. But nobody, no sci working scientist seeing these uh, four data points would say, oh, let's draw the fourth degree polynomial through them like this, <laughs> right? We'd say, let's go for the simpler theory <laughs> and just say, yeah, so why aren't they on the line? Oh, that's experimental error, we hope. Um, so simpler theories are not the best fit to the data. So even if we, so we actually go for simpler theories even if the more complicated one fits the data better. Um, sometimes we can't tell the simpler from the more complicated, we go for the simpler. So like Newton had this theory of gravity Right? The force is GMM uh, over R squared. Um, here's another theory uh, you could have instead of R squared, R to this power. I bet to, uh, for all the observations Newton was going to make, they would produce exactly the same predictions. It would fit the data, fit the observation just as well. But everybody knew that this is a better theory than this. Nobody even talked about this theory. I've never heard anybody talk about this theory other than myself. It's just uh, crazy. Um, but why? I mean, well, this one's prettier. This is more elegant. Now, you could say maybe this is just mere convenience that we go for these simpler theories or some kind of aesthetic preference. So I've heard this said, like, we like to hang around with pretty stuff. So if we're scientists, we prefer the prettier theories because we're going to spend a lot of time with them and, you know, we don't want to be in ugly surroundings. But if it's like something subjective like that, then it's just that's all there is to it, then you wonder how is it that we actually get to a truth so effectively in these things? Why is it that uh, the Copernican way of thinking of where we go for simpler theories has led to so much, much better science? Um, it's the beautiful mathematics describes the world better, it seems. Um, Einstein's like kind of fam uh, famous or infamous, depending on whom you ask. In his, in one of his, uh, he has this popular book on relativity theory, and he basically says at some point, like when he sketches the theory that 
yeah, n now that we see how you know, elegant all this stuff is, without any experimental data, we just know it's true. <laughs> now, I think there he's overstating the case because you might come up with something else that's also nearly as beautiful maybe and that fits the data better. You, I think you do need some experimental data. But there's something to the thought that, you know, the fact that it's beautiful, that's like really important and it's somehow evidence for truth. But how? And especially how if beauty is merely in the eye of the beholder? I mean, are we like, so if it's in the eye of the beholder, the beho we beholders have evolved a long, long time before contemporary science. How is it that the kind of perceptions that we evolved as a, of beauty as a spandrel to something else like mate selection, now, 50, 100,000 years later, are guiding us to getting the right theories of physics, say. Especially physics, I guess. It's puzzling. So go back to the initial mystery. So now I'll go back to my three figures in the Christian tradition. Two of them have a saint in front of their name in the Catholic tradition. The third one got in a little bit of trouble with the Catholic Church and doesn't have a saint in front of his name. Um, so the first one is Augustine, who wondered, he wondered like where the infinity of the numbers lived. You know, there's this infinity of the numbers. And he liked Pla uh, Platonism, but he didn't want just to sort of uh, these forms to just be out there. So he had this theory that the forms this platonic stuff, this mysterious uh, abstract objects, that they are actually in a mind, but not our mind. They will be too subjective. They're in the mind of God. And this kind of tamed the infinity of the numbers. They're all like contained in the mind of God. Um, Augustine has this like uh, kind of mysterious line saying that the, that the numbers are really finite. And what he means by that, he doesn't mean something crazy like they stop at one billion or something. What he means is finite means sort of bounded. And they're bounded by the mind of God, they're by being in something. They're in the mind of God. And so they're bounded in that sense. They're, they're fi finite, just sort of literally in Latin, is what I mean bounded. So they're there. Um, I read this uh, book once that by... Um, a mathematician. It was a book draft, never got published. I think it ought to get published. He, he showed me his manuscript. He's, he, he's, he's no longer alive. He was a Holocaust survivor, so died a number of years ago. I haven't been able to track down a copy of the manuscript anymore. I, I'm hoping his family has it somewhere, and eventually I'll track it down. But he, he let me read this, and he had, the, uh, he had this argument. Uh, he wasn't Christian. Uh, I mean, he was, uh, I guess, I mean, he was ethnically Jewish. I don't know if he was religiously Jewish or he, if he was religious at all. But it was an argument that Christianity made modern mathematics possible. And the line, I don't know how convinced I'm by everything he says in that book. Um, uh, this is, by the way, uh, Melzack is his name. Um, and he's got some nice math books, too. But uh, in this book uh, that is pu uh, unpublished, he said, the Greeks, the ancient Greeks were kind of troubled by infinity. And he thought that part of the reason they were troubled at least, maybe all of it, was religious reasons. Their gods were finite. Their gods were very limited. And so anything infinite is like beyond the gods. Now it sounds kind of irreligious. You're speaking of things beyond the gods. The Greeks really didn't like infinity that much. They talked of like the... Um, the apparent, the sort of unlimited, but they kind of felt of it as a kind of vague and wa wishy, washing out around the edges rather than something sharp and real just extending genuinely to infinity. Um, they, but in August, but uh, according to Melzack, we, Augustine gives us, and the Christian tradition then gets us insight, God is infinite, and then, and the infinities of numbers and mathematics in general it's, you, you can tame it by containing it in the mind of God. It starts to make more sense. It doesn't just sort of stretch off, off to some, somewhere and end in fog. It's actually all there sharply in the mind of God, he thought. And so he thought this is what allowed for this concept of a real, genuine infinity, which is then essential to the development of the calculus. 
Now, I don't know how much of that is good history and understand it, but it's a, it's, a, it's a plausible story. So on Augustine's theory, like the deflationary theory that mathematics just depend on mind, mathematics is about thoughts. And that kind of fits, you know, abstract things. They kind of feel like uh, thoughts. But uh, for Augustine, it's not our thoughts. That would be subjective. It's God's thoughts, and that makes them be objective. And this, I think, yields answers to many questions you might have about mathematics. So let me just give a few. Right? What are numbers, shapes, sets, etc.? Well, they're ideas in the mind of God. And even though God is mysterious, we at least have some idea of what ideas are because we have ideas. <laughs> right? um, how do we know mathematics? How do we evolved apes get it? Well, Augustine didn't have Darwin's theory of evolution. He toyed with some theories of evolution, but uh, not with, certainly not with Darwin's. But you might sort of extend his thinking and think, hey, yeah, look, God, we all know our own ideas, nothing particularly mysterious. We, have, we can see our, how, what we're thinking by just looking inside ourselves. So God can see his own ideas. So God knows mathematics by just looking inside his mind. And then God can create intelligent beings in his image whose thinking matches these ideas. There are difficult questions on how to fit God's design of human beings with the kind of randomness that's at the heart of evolutionary theory. I have some thoughts on that, but that's a topic for a very different kind of uh, talk on a different topic. Why is mathematics worth doing? Well, here's one interesting thing that uh, um, the Greeks didn't think it's worth doing, be, or yeah, I guess they didn't think uh, that mathematics tells us a bit about God's mind. So, a kind of an interesting religious aspect to it. Um, mathematics kind of start, it had a lot of religious aspects early on. Pythag the Pythagoreans were a kind of religion, but it wasn't about a God. This is like about a God, or the, a God with a capital G. Why is mathematics beautiful? Well, maybe it something, has something to do with the idea that God is perfectly beautiful. Um, one of the things that's kind of striking, I think, about human religions as a phenomenon is that there's a great focus on beauty. I mean, so m some of the greatest beautiful things on earth, buildings, paintings, sculptures, works of music, works of literature, are inspired by, re by religion. There's something, some kind of close tie between being religious and, be, and, and, and a kind of focus on beauty, the sublime, the beautiful. And maybe that has something to do with God being perfectly beautiful. So, and if God's perfectly beautiful, maybe God's mind is, uh, we would expect the ideas in God's mind to have a beauty to them. Still a bit of a puzzle. Um, if all mathematics in the mind of God, what about ugly mathematics? Because there is ugly mathematics, right? For those of us who've studied mathematics, we've all done ugly mathematics in various classes where you just have to churn through this bunch of formulas and there's nothing really particularly beautiful. You just expand, multiply out these polynomials and it goes on and on. And we're, we're at the end, you know, as a mathematician, I'm unsatisfied if that's like what's at the heart of a proof, but you know, that, that's how it is. There seems to be some ugly mathematics. Now, I don't know what to say about that, uh, sort of uh, thinking about God. Maybe it's like, there are parts of larger undiscovered patterns yet. Maybe there's a beauty there that we haven't discovered yet. I don't know. I don't know. And I don't know if it's actually ugly. It's maybe just less beautiful. If that's all we had, maybe we'd say, oh, that's kind of nice. But, but we have you know, some aspects that are more, even more beautiful. So maybe it's, more, it's a question of less beautiful and more beautiful. I don't know. Why does our sense of the beautiful extend to mathematics? Well, Augustine, I think, is very much in this, has this idea he doesn't talk about this sense of mathematics and beauty, but he, he very much has this idea that we learn a lot, we, we have all our knowledge sort of ultimately founded on the fact that God enlightens us in some way. And so I think he would say, say if he was asked where our, how we get our sense of the beautiful that extends to mathematics, God gives it to us. Again, how that fits with a story of us being evolved apes, I think it can. I think God is in control of the kinds of evolutionary pressures we are under. God is under control of the kinds of uh, environment we're in, and uh, I think uh, you can, can make this work. Why does beautiful mathematics describe the universe? That's not something we have a great answer in Augustine, but we might say something like, well, the world's at least we would expect it to be beautiful 
and to open us to the beauty of God. There's a different puzzle about mathematics that I haven't quite yet talked about. It has something to do with the certainty of mathematics. How do we do mathematics, right? We don't just do it like, like artists do art, where you just sit down and you know, have these con beautiful conceptions and you put them down. You like do proof. You do it by logic. And that's the primary way to do mathematics. Not the only way. There's like experimental mathematics where you do computer calculations and uh, you do that. But sort of the ultimate goal sort of of much of math, most of mathematics is you, you prove things using logic. How does logic work? How does it get us to these ideas in the mind of God? That's, I think, that's, I think, a puzzle for uh, Augustine, uh, for, would be a puzzle for Augustine if he thought about it. I don't know if he thought about it. I, I don't remember seeing him think about this. Uh, here's a, a, a line of thought from St. Thomas Aquinas. It doesn't apply to mathematics, uh, as far as I know, but it, it's, uh, it, it's, uh, it's how I like to think about this, and it's inspired by him. So August, uh, sorry, Aquinas, so we, we're jumping from you know, the, the fourth century to the 13th century now. Uh, he has two insights here that I think are helpful. One, what it is for something to be possible is that it's within God's power. There's this theory of possibility. Possibility is what's within God's power. And then God's power extends to all the things that are in some broad sense logically coherent, what makes logical sense, what's not a contradiction. So what's possible is made possible by God's power, and God's power is tied to what is logically possible, to what is logically coherent. So in a way, I think uh, Aquinas would have to say the logic is a study of God's power. It's a study of sort of, it's kind of like the limit, the logic says what, what it, it's not really boundaries, I think, but in some, in some manner of speaking, what is the boundaries on God's power? So if God's, and God's mathematical ideas, maybe we could then say, are ideas about what arrangements of things are within God's power. So maybe God's mathematical ideas of numbers are, are like what kind of numerical arrangements are possible. And so then if logic is a study of God's power and God's mathematical ideas are ideas about what kinds of things can be arranged within God's power, then we can get a kind of intertwining of logic and mathematics and of Augustine's insight that mathematics is about the mind of God and this idea that we've had since at least Euclid that uh, mathematics, that the way we get this beautiful certainty in mathematics is through logic. And it's because logic is how we st study what God can do, because he can do anything that's in some se sense logically coherent. Okay, third of the, the, the figures, skipping a little bit less uh, than from Augustine to uh, Aquinas, Skipping now from Aquinas to Galileo, so that's like what, about 300 years now. We have this very famous quote from Galileo. Philosophy is written in this grand book. Now, philosophy here means all natural human knowledge, right? So, right, even to this day, right, uh, the uh, scientists in all the fields the main graduate degree is the PhD, the philosophy doctorate. So philosophy is here was until recently understood as encompassing uh, all the sciences. Um, and there would be something, the, the sciences would be called like natural philosophy as distinguished from other kinds of philosophy. So philosophy here means basically all human knowledge, but specifically he's thinking of uh, natural philosophy, namely science, what we now call science. Philosophy is written in this grand book, which stands continually open before our eyes. I say the universe, that's a, his parenthesis. So he's just telling us, here, I've given you a metaphor, <laughs> it's this book. By that I mean the universe, in case you didn't uh, guess it. But cannot be, complete, cannot be understood without first learning to comprehend the language and know the characters as it is written, right? This is like an, 
a, an obvious insight, right? A book is useless to you if you don't know the language it's written in, and even more useless if you don't know the alphabet it's written in, right? So you've got to know. So philosophy is written in this book in the universe, which is a grand book, but cannot be understood without the language. What is this language? It is written, says Galileo, in mathematical language, and its characters are triangles, circles, and other geometric figures, without which it is impossible to humanly understand a word. Without these, one is wandering in a dark labyrinth. Mm, dark. Um, yeah. And we kind of think about what happened. This is, uh, this is when, this is around when modern science really gets going. Aristotle had a science, and it was, he was a serious scientist among the ancient Greeks. I mean, he, it is said in the morning you would find Aristotle in the fish market looking for fresh fish to dissect, to do biology. He would like, you know, really do as good science as he empirically could. But Aristotle's science was not mathematical. He did not have this insight that the language that the world is written in is a mathematical language. You can imagine, imagine you open a math book, but you don't know any mathematics. You don't know the alphabet it's written in. And you can you see some patterns in that book. You know, there are certain things that recur from time to time. Like often you have like these two lines, one above the other, and you can try to find where the, the patterns as to where that occurs. But until you realize what all this means, it's, it's, you're not going to get very, very far. Around Galileo's time and uh, his predecessor, Copernicus, we're starting to see this, that there's the mathematical language behind the world. And now it's starting to fit. It's starting to make sense. Now, even though Galileo got in trouble with the Catholic Church, he's a serious, he's a serious Catholic. He, this is, he's serious about this idea of language. And a language is something that is used by an author. He's really thinking, there is an author. There's somebody who writes the book of nature. It's God. And I think this is like kind of an insight. Like you read a book. You, suppose you pick up a book at random. Um, you eventually sort of learn the genre of the book. Oh, I was expecting, I wasn't expecting this to be science fiction, but it is. Mm, surprising. Then you start understanding it better once you understand the genre. And you eventually maybe learn the language. Now, usually we come to books already knowing the language. But sometimes you could imagine, sometimes, you know, we find ancient uh, texts and we have to figure out the language. That's tricky, and, uh, but very tricky. Um, so, sorry. So we, we, we need to figure out the, the genre and the language, what kind of thing it is. And Galileo's insight, I think, is what makes the scientific revolution possible. We finally at that time have fig figured out that the language is the language of mathematics and the genre is a kind of genre of elegant mathematics of a certain kind. And so I think you can make a pretty good case that um, the scientific revolution was made possible by this idea that there's a creator who loves beautiful mathematics. And and makes the world in the image of this beautiful mathematics. And so then we have an answer to this, one of the starting puzzles I had. Why is elegant and beautiful mathematics so useful? It's so useful because God chose to create the world embodying it. And if this uh, kind of story is right, then there's a danger that if one is an atheist and doing science, one is cutting the branch one is sitting on. Because why would you expect beautiful mathematics to, in fact, be, give, you, give you the truth about the world? Now, if the world is designed by a being in whose mind mathematics is and who loves the beauty of mathematics, then it makes sense. Otherwise, it's a, it remains a deep mystery. So sort of three things. Augustine's insight, mathematics is about the mind of God. 
Aquinas' insight that logic is about the power of God. And then we put the, together of Galileo's insight that the world is created in accordance with, by, by God in accordance with mathematics. By the way, I want to say something maybe about the genre too, which is kind of interesting. I think the kind of beauty and theories that we have differs between, there's actually probably like multiple subworlds, maybe kind of multiple books. Um, so physics has one kind of beauty where it's very much about short, elegant uh, formulas with elegant symmetries and so on. Biology has a kind of different con conception of beauty. It's more uh, maybe about diversity or something like that. Um, and I think other sciences may have a somewhat different tweak. So it's, a, it's actually a little bit more complex. It's not, it's not the world has kind of all got one kind of beauty to it. It's multiple kinds of beauty. Okay. So where, where did this go? And then we can have the discussion. So I think theism, the belief in God, allows one to say some things about mathematics that see, sound right. Or, or at least, uh, sorry, I shouldn't say sound right. It allows one to explain certain things about mathematics. Why is it true? It's true because it describes the ideas, ideas in the mind of God. Why is it no, how is it that we know it? We know it because God created us to know it. Why is it beautiful? It's beautiful because it's about the mind of God, and God is beautiful. Is it why is it useful? Because it applies to the world, because God wrote the world in that language. Logic then describes the otherwise unlimited power of God. And, and now I move from the scientific revolution. An elegant theory that explains much is likely to be true. From these thoughts of Augustine, Aquinas, and Galileo, we get an elegant theory of the meaning, the usefulness, and the beauty of mathematics. It explains a lot about mathematics and its usefulness. So it's probably true. So, in particular, probably there's a God, because that's one of the suppositions of the theory. It's not a proof. Maybe, you know, it's, a, it's an inference to a good explanation, or maybe even a best explanation, but maybe somebody will find better ones. But I think it's a, it is an argument. Uh, the famous uh, person in the history of philosophy who tried to argue from mathematics to the existence of God was Leibniz, by the way. And uh, he thought uh, roughly this kind of Augustinian picture that uh, mathematics about ideas, well, or that ideas in the mind of God are the best way to explain various things about uh, our understanding and therefore require God. Thank you. And now, some, and now an ad for our graduate program in case there are any philosophy uh, undergraduates here. You can talk to me afterwards, after the official discussion if you're interested. Oops. So we'll do a Q&A now, so whoever has. So you want me to just take oh, it? Yeah. Okay, go ahead. <laughs> Let's start at the front. Okay, uh, I just had a quick question. So you mentioned that um, you would say, or that St. Thomas Aquinas would agree broadly with the statement that logic is a study of the power of God, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, but. Uh, if logic is sort of finite because some things are possible, some things are impossible, mm -hmm. I, I feel like if you approach God only from like the logical perspective, that would make it seem like God's powers are finite, which I mean, we know as Catholics, that is not true. Um, so what are other methods of like understanding or studying God's power? Well, so Aquinas, I think, thinks like logic is like the only limit on, uh, on the power of God. Um, it's not really a limit, he says, though. This is, I, uh, so I, I, I hedged a little bit when I said it's, it's, a, it's a boundary or limit because he insists it's not really a limit because basically if it's not logical, it doesn't make sense. So there's like nothing. So you, know, so you might say it's a limit on God that he can't create something that's both a circle and a square at the same time. And Aquinas would say, no, that's not a limit. It's just there's no such, th it just doesn't make sense. Like, if somebody says, 
I think God can create something that's both a circle and a square. Aquinas would say, they just said a bunch of nonsense. And I said, God can blah, blah, blah. <laughs> Yeah, okay, you can't disagree with that, really. It's just they've said a bunch of nonsense, really, about what God can. And, uh, and uh, yeah, so there, there's nothing to it. So it's not really a limitation on God. It's just kind of a statement of, like, what kind of things are meaningful to say about God. And the things that aren't meaningful to say about God aren't meaningful to say about God. So I don't think it limits God to any kind of finiteness. It just means, you know, the, it, what we say about God makes sense. And God is, uh, okay, right, this is kind of an argument by pun, right? But Christ is, uh, in the Gospel of John, is described as the word. The word in Greek is logos. Logos is where we get logic from. Now, that's not, that sounds like just sort of, you know, going from related word to related word doesn't make, but it actually, is, there's something serious here because even though we tran uh, most in, in English translations translate logos as word, it's a very broad term in Greek and often in Greek philosophy it means something like reason. So, and I think the church fathers often understand Christ as God's reason, God's reasoning, God's uh, logical mind. Um, the ancient Greek philosophers had this idea that there's like this logos that suffuses all nature, this reason behind all nature. And I think when John is writing his gospel, he's, he's uh, referring to, to some of these ideas and sort of Christianizing them. And so, yeah, reality is logical. God is logos. God is reason. It's all reasonable. Let's see how we shall do it. Let's maybe just move row by row. Because I can't keep track of the order people put hands up in. And we've got lots of time. It was a great talk. Thank you, all. I'm curious, what would you say is the relationship between faith and logic and math? I didn't hear faith come up a whole lot. Yeah. I don't know. Well, I mean, faith is a lot. Well, yeah. So I never thought about it in those terms. So that's why I didn't talk about it. But now you've asked me the questions. So I'm thinking about this, right? <laughs> Um, my first move was going to be, yeah, faith, that's for theology, not for philosophy. But that's not, I don't actually think that. I think there's like a kind of natural faith as well that we have. Um, I guess I would try to say something like this. Um, maybe one place is what to do with the axioms, right? So we have a, uh, our mathematical reasoning starts somewhere. It starts with some axioms. How do we know those to be true? Well, we don't prove them. That would give us an endless regress. We'd have to prove them from other axioms and so on. We, just, we can just see that they've got to be true. And maybe that's a... So if we start with axioms, maybe that's a kind of faith there. Um, if we don't start with axioms, if we think mathematics is more about proof, um, then still we have this uh, faith that our methods of proof get things right, maybe that they're the right ways of reasoning, that our lo logic gets things at things right. I mean, I think in the end, there's something like faith and the trusting that our faculties of reason work. It's the best I can do on the spot. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so what, what would you think about, like, being Hassenfelder type take with her book, like Lost in Math, How Beauty Leads Physics Astray, trying to present stuff like string theory and supersymmetry stuff as like counterexamples as, I mean, she, she tries to say it's like they haven't produced much and they haven't found evidence because they're, they're trying to use beauty as like uh. to support their things, but in their use of that as a theoretical virtue, has it, has it produced much fruit? Um, yeah. So as like a kind of counterexample to. Yeah. Well. Yeah. I mean, there's. I mean, notice how I sort of I illustrated this was like, beauty in terms of fit, uh, beauty uh, the most beautiful theory that fits the data, right? And lots of beautiful uh, theories that ha in mathematics that seem to have no application to, uh, to the physical world at all. And that kind of makes sense because if you think of you know, sort of logic and mathematics is about the, the power of God, well, not everything. God, God has all sorts of powers that he doesn't exercise. He could have created all sorts of other things. 
So, uh, so maybe that's a part of an answer is that, yeah, so not all mathematics applies, right? It has to be a sort of mathematics guided by experiment and maybe, you know, I don't know. I, I don't know that I want to, you know, criticize uh, my, uh, my string theory loving friends, but, uh, or one friend, I guess. <laughs> not that much of a friend, a colleague, let's say. I like him. Um, <laughs> But, uh, you know, th yeah, maybe sometimes, you know, we should have gone astray, yeah, by sort of going a little too far away from experiment. I mean, there's a kind of uh, danger also maybe in theology and philosophy that's kind of related. So there's a kind of form of argument where you think Aquinas does this. And, and I don't mean to say it's a bad form of argument, just something you have to be cautious about. He says, this is what we would expect a good God to do. It's fitting, he says. It fits the character of God. So, so God did it. And arguments like that, I think there's something to it. But there's also, you know, it's, you need a lot of caution. Uh, yeah, is our sense of beauty really tracking God's sense of beauty that, that closely that we can... We can, like, before the fact, like, make these predictions that he's going to do things this way rather than that way. I, I think we've got to be very cautious. And uh, so I think the science does need to stay empirical. And, and it's, you know, like Galileo says, it's like reading, right? It's reading the book of the world. It's not like sitting back away from the observations of the world and trying to come up with some math and then hoping it'll fit. I mean, even Einstein, even though he does sometimes talk of, like, you know, this theory even without any empirical data, you, we would have good reasons to think it's true. He's not doing that. I mean, look how much empirical data he's, uh, even on the very simplest level he has, like, that there is space, <laughs> that there is time, that there is motion. This is like highly em empirical stuff. If you just sat down and do some math, you might just do some stuff about, uh, uh, some stuff about division rings and, uh, and have uh, nothing about time or space or dimensions or vector spaces or nothing like that or, or manifolds. And you still have beautiful mathematics, but just don't think that has much to do with the, the world, maybe. So I think, yeah, not all mathematics is, uh, is useful, and which is also interesting. Let's see, we're moving back along the first half. Anybody else on the first side? No? OK, then we can start at the back of the second one. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I would, I would try to avoid doing it because, I, because uh, clever people would then find counterexamples. <laughs> no, uh, I mean, so uh, more seriously, I mean, I did try once and I, it wasn't very helpful, but I thought beauty is kind of like being divine. And that sounds weird. That sounds like being God, like only God's divine. But I think there's a sense of divine that's kind of broader than God. Like you say something's divinely you know, divine cheesecake. Okay, that, that's maybe too broad, but there's some, there's some kind of extra breadth, like divine sense of relating to God in certain ways closely. That's my best, but it's very vague. Like in what way? To what degree? I don't know. Um, so I, well, I've tried to do that, and I've got like this lecture I gave at Oxford where I try to do that. Um, not very happy with, with that approach. Um, I... I think probably the safer thing to do is to say this. One of the things I think we've learned in the history of philosophy is that no important philosophical concept can be defined. We can say things about it. We can give necessary conditions sometimes, sometimes sufficient conditions. We can talk about the logical connections. But I don't think we can define it, because defining it means reducing it to something else. And some concepts are fundamental, and I think the really important ones are fundamental. So much of, for instance, 20th century philosophy, or not much, but as there's an enormous amount of 20th century philosophy dedicated to trying to find a definition of knowledge. And by and large, philosophers eventually concluded, yeah, this, uh, this is, a few people still work on that project, but most people have decided that this is a waste of time. This is not, actually, we're not getting anywhere. Um, and the way they discovered a bunch of interesting things about knowledge that, that are useful. I think the same is uh, beauty. We can say a bunch of interesting things about it, 
about its connections to other things, maybe connections to truth and other things, uh, logic, mathematics, God, uh, perception. But I don't think goodness, but I don't think we can define it. Yeah. Yeah, I was going to ask, some of the examples you brought up, like the gravitational law being 2 rather than 2.001, it seems like that would be a consequence of just living in a three-dimensional space and the geometry works out. How many of these coincidences does, it, does that explain? I don't think it is. I mean, it is if you have this kind of vague idea that here's how gravity works. There's like this kind of thing, the gravitational field, which spreads out and decreases with the inverse square. But it's, you know, it's not like a substance that spreads out in this way. I mean, that's maybe a kind of useful way to think about it, but it, I don't see that. I mean, it's, it's a force. It's a force with a certain power law to it. Uh, it seems like perfectly coherent that the power law be 3 or 1 or 2.1. Um, I don't think it's right to think of it. Newton certainly didn't think there was something spreading out. Now, Leibniz did. Leibniz did have this idea that there was like, that there was like this, vort this vortex of the ether, this spinning around the sun, and that did actually predict uh, uh, an inverse square law because it spread out. I guess it did. I don't know. I, 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 I don't know the details of his vortex theory. But Newton did not. Newton famously said, he does, I do not make hypotheses. I'm not going to tell you how gravity works. I'm just going to tell you the mathematical law of it. Um, and Leibniz was horrified by this. He thought that you, you need to do the, give this. And in a way, I think the history of science said, uh, yeah, actually, uh, Newton, Newton was cl closer to being right in this debate than the Leibniz. So I think, uh, yeah, I'm inclined to just go with what Newton says. It's, it's a law of nature. It's an inverse square law, or at least was an uh, that was the theory then, and it's not about any kind of spreading out. And at least I can say this, when Newton figured, it, when Newton posited it, he wasn't, I think, doing it because of some kind of weird spreading out of uh, attractive force. So light does spread out that way. So for light, it makes perfect sense to say, yeah, okay, the intensity of light goes as the inverse square of the distance because it's got to be spread out over the surface of a sphere. The surface of a sphere is proportional to the square of the radius. But I don't think that's, I don't think it's, uh, it's like light. Or at least, certainly for Newtonian uh, gravity isn't like light. And Einsteinian gravity isn't a thing at all. It's uh, the curvature of space or something, or say, I mean, the supervenes on the curvature of space. Yeah, I mean, I, I can partially answer. If you assume conservation of energy, and you assume the space is invariant, like up and down or arbitrary, then you get the square. You get the two on the next. But you can't have a non-inverse square force? You make those two assumptions, you get two. Under what other assumptions? I mean, you could. I mean, conservation of energy is a big one, right? Yeah. That's a big assumption. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Black shirt, uh, third row from the back, middle. Mm. idea holds. Because I remember yeah. when I took an anthropology class in my freshman year, the professor said the opposite. <laughs> like there was an anthropologist thought for a while that you could explain like all of human family structure with concealed ovulation and the fact that when the cycles sync up. So that forces, you know, not yeah. just the alpha can mate with all the females, so you get genetic diversity and then the family yeah. makes the, the father stick around and It's a great question. Yeah, that's a great question. 
Yeah, I said something about, you know, the genre and the kind of beauty is different in the different areas. So it, um, it's not mathematical simplicity in anthropology, obviously. But even there, there's, so may, maybe it's too strong to say that the simplest explanation is likely to be true, but it's at least more likely maybe to be true than a, just a randomly chosen more complicated one. Maybe we can say that much. Um, and I, I mean, here's the thought though. I mean, so take the early anthropologists who had this uh, simple theory and they managed to explain a bunch of stuff uh, with it. Until you find stuff that doesn't fit that theory, it seems like it was a reasonable thing to believe. It's a cool theory. And then eventually you find, okay, there's some data that doesn't fit this. So it's, of course, the simplest theory that fits the data is what, what we're after. And then it stops fitting the data. So yeah, we're disappointed, right? I mean, uh, a little bit. And, and that just happens, right? Uh, uh, sometimes, right, you, 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 you find you need to add some terms to your equations or something. And that's just how it, how it is, yeah. Yeah, yeah. But I guess there's a difference between not wanting to reinvent the wheel and just insisting we got to keep this wheel because we like this wheel. So let's just go on the wheel until it falls apart from the fact that it really doesn't work. Yeah. So I mean, there is like this judgment call, right? At what point do you do you stop uh, adding epicycles, right? You can always, right? In the whatever, right? Uh, uh, we now know that whatever patterns of movement the planets made, you could have uh, reconstructed them with enough epicycles to whatever precision you want, right? Um, but after, you know, several, after like four or five layers of epicycles, this is sounding uh, less and less plausible, um, that that's actually describing uh, how it actually is operating right? rather than just how it, what predicts the data, what predicts the observations. So yeah, maybe, yeah, so there, there is a reasonable choice to be made. And maybe likely to be true was a bit, is a bit of an overstatement. Um, more likely than competitors is a more cautious thing. But not unlikely, I don't know. I was just wondering if yeah. you No, I mean, that is really interesting. I mean, so, some of this, you know, sort of personal history, you know, I, I for, when I think of the sciences, it, I tend to focus on uh, the hard sciences, and uh, and that skews my perception in philosophy of science. Uh, um, and so, yeah, may, maybe I am a little bit skewed in this way. And that's a, that's a real worry too. Yeah. 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 So I mean, there. That was actually why Galileo got in trouble. Actually, was people were the the various people in the Catholic Church were quite happy to admit that his theory was a simpler, and b fit the data just as well, and and c was more convenient for computation. What they weren't willing to do is say, therefore, it's true. And the objection was theological. It was, it was this. It was, look, God is all-powerful. Yeah, he could have done it your way, Galileo. But he could also have done it the other way. Who are you to say that God did it the simpler way if they both fit the data equally well? And I guess I feel, uh, I think that the history of science then said Galileo was actually right. And those theologians, they weren't doing enough... Uh, they weren't taking enough into account how, yeah, we can actually, from looking at the world, figure out that God is after a certain kind of mathematical simplicity. That it's, but, you know, I think you can make a case that maybe the, there was something to what those theologians were saying. Yeah. <laughs> but given the data available at that time, 
it was pro it was I think the better theory. That's uh, right. the way. Yeah, I mean, Leibniz says like this fa this letter he wrote to Rome saying, you know, you guys should rehabilitate Galileo because in fact, in fact, the whole question doesn't make sense because all uh, motion all motion, including in his case non non uh, inertial motion, is relative, and so there's no fact of the matter as to whether the Earth goes around the Sun or the Sun goes around the Earth, and that in fact is what the, the a relativistic truth seems to be the case, but I don't think that made any impression in Rome <laughs> or any positive impression. This random Protestant guy writing to Rome. <laughs> yeah. So um, if math is so beautiful and so like in tune with our nature, why do so many people not like it? <laughs> <laughs> That's a good question. Um, so I don't like music. This is, I don't know, some people are horrified. Yeah, I don't like music. I, I find it annoying, um, mildly annoying. Um, but I know that music is objectively beautiful, and so I think it's a defect in me. You can extrapolate from that to what I say. <laughs> think about mathematics. I don't have that defect in mathematics. <laughs> But I do have it in music. This is, you know, as a Christian, this is kind of one of the things I hope for is that, uh, I mean, part of it may be kind of sensory defect or some kind of brain processing defect. I don't know. In my case, um, in mathematics, it may be that it takes particularly a lot of skill to get to a certain level of understanding for these things to fit together. Um, also, there's the fact, besides that, I mean, there's just sort of pragmatic things. Mathematics is often not taught very well. It's not taught with a focus on uh, the beautiful and so on. Um, proof is not much shown. Um, and maybe there are good reasons for this, like that it's hard. But I don't know. I think that there's something about the teaching of it as, as well, I think. And I think maybe the way it's taught has something to be said against. I mean, when I taught, the, I taught uh, calculus maybe twice. And I know I did not make it convey the beauty of mathematics. <laughs> I could see it on the students' faces, <laughs> and I could see, and I could hear myself droning on, and it just was not conveying the beauty of mathematics. I was not a good math teacher. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so this is um, maybe tangentially related, but uh, with I mean, you were talking about mathematics being a language and um, has a you know has a logic to it. Um, do you uh, do you think that our conception of mathematics with like objects like derivatives and Fourier transforms things like that is that the do you think those are the only type of mathematics that could have formed? Or what do you could we have created entirely different mathematics that accomplish many of the things we want to do, but with different mathematical objects? It's a good question. I suspect we could. I wonder if it would fit the world as well. Maybe maybe like I mean. For Newton, the development of calculus sort of goes hand in hand with uh, getting a theory that fits the world. So I, d I don't. Uh, so may maybe if we have this constraint that we wanted to fit physics, so there, that puts some constraints. But there might be some very different ways. I mean, of proceeding. It wouldn't surprise me. I think of the uh, the, the film Arrival and the story it's based on here. Yeah. Earlier you were talking about the idea of beauty being in the eye of beholder being a wrong idea in a sense, versus there being like varying degrees of beauty. Mm -hmm. Would you say that with that, if the beauty of mathematics helps to describe the mind of God within mathematics, there being degrees of beauty, would you also say that to the mind of God that there are degrees of beauty, or would you say that the beauty of his mind is absolute? Mm. I think what's uh, so. This, I'm really glad you asked this, because as I was saying that stuff, I started worrying about the, this thing. And, and I went on, feeling slightly dirty for going on with this while, <laughs> while war, leaving this worry behind. So I'm glad to come back to it. So let's see if I can say anything about this. Um, maybe I can say something like this. It's, uh, you know, so God is in the, the Aquinas thinks and much of the Christian tradition 
and also Jewish tradition and to a lesser extent Islamic tradition thinks God is simple. There's like a kind of inner unity to God. And so maybe when we say this is God's idea, it's like we're describing God sort of, well, to use Paul's phrase, in a mirror darkly, even so, when, whenever we use any of our language about God. And so it may be that those degrees are in just how darkly we're representing God. I, that's the best I have right now. <laughs> but I, I'm worried a, a little bit about this, too. yeah. And maybe that we're just not seeing the beauty that's, uh, that's there quite as much as we should. Um, yeah. yeah. Um, could you elaborate on what you called the ugly mathematics? Is this just patterns that we haven't discovered yet? I don't or? know. I, I, so I just remember like um, proving a theorem at, at some point and it was so complicated and none of it was like that interesting. Like it was, you, you, ha you broke it up, I don't know how many, like half a dozen cases. Each of them got broken up into a bunch of other subcases. Okay, if it's, if we've, got the, we've got this kind of graph here and functions on this graph. It could be this way or this way or this way or this way. If it's this way, then it could be this way or this way or this way. Each one just sort of slog through. It's terrible. It was like ugly. And uh, I don't know, that, that's kind of my picture. It's like of an ugly proof is really complicated and you just have to sort of break it up in a lot of cases and figure it out. So I sort of maybe like the ultimate is where it's only a computer can do this. So like, um, what is it, the four color theorem that any two dimensional map can be colored with four colors so that you don't have two countries share, having a boundary that are the same color. Um, that was proved by a computer going through thousands and thousands of cases, like dividing up into different ways that countries could border. And it's, there's a fair amount of interesting mathematical work in, in getting it down to a finite number of uh, cases. But then computer just goes and does it all. And you can have the computer print out its reasoning. It's going to be just awfully ugly. <laughs> and that, that's kind of one kind of thing. It was just have to do an ugly calculation. But other ugly mathematics is, you know, like, you know, there's some ugly mathematics, right? Um, 854 times 96 is 81,984. Where's the beauty in that? I don't know, <laughs> but it's true, <laughs> right? Or at least my calculator says it's true. <laughs> Do you think there's like an undiscovered beauty there? Or could be, I mean, it could be, it wouldn't surprise me. But, uh, you know, it's undiscovered if, they, if it's there. I mean, you know, when I, when I gave, gave uh, so there, the one time I was really unsatisfied as a mathematician in doing a, an ugly proof was a case where the result I was proving was like really intuitive. It was a result about how if you've got a random walk, you're moving around randomly and you're facing various dangers and you're trying to maximize your probability of getting out of a blind alley, how you arrange the dangers. And it was very intuitive that you arrange them so that you put the more dangerous ones closer to the exit because you spend less time closer to the exit. And, and so there was like, the result was kind of beautiful and uh, it made a lot of intuitive sense to me why it's true. But the proof had nothing to do with these intuitions. It was just something, some manipulation of matrices and a, running through us. Uh, how a sorting algorithm works with it and uh, showing that uh, yeah, you, you can prove it. And it had nothing to do with, I felt like that proof hadn't, didn't say anything about why it's true. It didn't tell me why it was true. And there was uh, some idea of why it's true. So I was really dissatisfied with that. But hey, you know, it was true. It was publishable, got published. So <laughs> happy that way, but uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Any book recommendations on this subject? No, I, 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 it's, it's not the, you know, I, Augustine is fun to read, I, I think, but uh, I mean, everybody should read some Augustine, I think, but uh, that doesn't mean everybody will enjoy it, just like not everybody enjoys mathematics, but everybody should do some. Um, so uh, Augustine has these dialogues uh, with his son on truth, I think. Some of that is in there, uh, so that's sort of on the classical side. But 
I don't know. I, I, I'm not a good book recommendation kind of person. I have to confess, this is like one of my big faults as a philosopher, is I don't actually like to read philosophy that much. Uh, I, I like to read science fiction and fantasy, but, but not, but I don't actually, I, I like some philosophy. I love reading Plato. Plato is beautiful, lovely. I love Plato. Occasionally, I have some other figures, there's something there, but it's, that, that I like to read, but otherwise I, I find it, I don't enjoy it that much. And I think it's a fault in me, actually, but so I, I'm not, I don't have great recommendations, sorry. Yeah. Maybe to go back to some of the stuff about the open mathematics and a few points before that. I've always kind of, um, so I'm kind of more of a scientist, uh, dealt with a lot of math in my day, I guess, but um, I've noticed that the more interesting mathematics is where you have two totally different things working on two totally different ends, and they come out with the same equation, the same yeah. form of equation that relates to uh, various physical objects. Mm. So, um, I mean, we can use gravity as an example, but yeah. you can work on two totally different routes um, with two totally different starting assumptions and everything else. You can come up with the same relationship between these variables. It seems really interesting. Um, versus there's other mathematics that, at least in science, is kind of developed as a well group relationship <coughs> that's um, a good approximation, but it doesn't have any necessarily predictive power. So a lot of like pure theoretical math that goes nowhere has no predictive power, versus a lot of just math that actually seems to uh, generate the same relationship between variables does have predictive power. So is there maybe a distinction to be made within math itself that is some math actually relates to the things in the world correctly, and uh, other math does not? I don't know. I think this is really interesting, actually. And, and I was thinking back to my examples of mathematical beauty, and I don't think what you, you said fitted with any of them. I think it's a new ca example I should add if I give this talk again, is cases where, yeah, you get this convergence where you can see the same thing from two very different mathematical points of view, and then it comes together and, and you see it, right? So like in physics, um, we've got like the original Newtonian uh, physics, and then you've got like these later Hamiltonian formulations in terms of variational principles, and they're very different mathematically, but then they come together. So getting back to the arrival and the story that comes, that it's based on, which is on this stuff. Um, yeah, so I think that that is a, a particular kind of beauty, and I guess it's also like it's actually kind of like a beauty of literature. We have it in literature often, right? So, so like the, often in literature, you have like these threads that the author is weaving, and you, you're kind of expecting, will they fit together? It's really unsatisfying if they don't, but then the really good author will make them all tie together, and that, that's lovely. And so I think, yeah, so, so some of the math that, that is helpful is like, I don't know that I would, I don't know that that feature of the beauty of mathematics makes it correlate with usefulness for describing the world. I think sometimes it, 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 it may, but I don't know if it, I don't know if, I, I just hadn't thought enough about it to know whether that correlates with it or it's just a really interesting form of beauty in mathematics where we get these surprising connections. I guess my question there's some math you could say that is the true math, that math namely that kind of has predictive power and outputs the same relationship between physical variables. And then there's some math that is, you would say maybe like a false math or not exactly the same math as thoughts in the mind of God but thoughts in the mind of men. It doesn't quite work out the same way. I guess I wouldn't want to go that way because I think, uh, you know, there, the math that doesn't describe the world can still, I, I think it's, it's still true math. It's just doesn't, describe the world. You know, Newton's math doesn't describe the world, it only does so approximately, but still true math, I think. Um, and there's like a true kind of beauty in certain things about, you know, cardinal arithmetic and high cardinality math, and none of that seems to have the least application to, any, uh, to anything uh, about describing the world around us. But hey, some of this is kind of beautiful. So I don't know, you know, there's something, you know, maybe it's, I mean, here's a, right. So Aquinas, uh, uh, well, sorry, I shouldn't just bring in Aquinas. Just, I don't need Aquinas for this. Um, just, you know, the world is in some sense finite. Um, 
I mean, even if it's like a multiverse, there's some importance since it's finite, I think it's bounded in some way by laws or something. And, and the realm of mathematics is infinite and the realm of God's mind is infinite. God chooses which, I, which of his infinitely many ideas to implement in the world and chooses wisely and well and beautifully but there's infinitely many things that are not implemented. You know, maybe we've got, you know, I don't actually know this, but maybe, you know, our physics seems to be, be based on the real numbers. We could have possible worlds where the physics is based on arithmetic module or some large prime instead. But that's not our world as far as we know. So I think, uh, and there's true mathematics regarding the other stuff too, I think, which describes what God could have done. Well, it's kind of actually one of the things I kind of like about um, science, as a, as a Christian about uh, science fiction and fantasy is I, especially fantasy actually in this case, is I think of fantasy as describing what God could have done, what kind of very different worlds he could have made. Often ones that don't exhibit the kind of mathematical beauty, but, but a different kind of uh, beauty, a magical beauty, say. <laughs> yeah. So like with that notion of infinite ideas in the mind of God, and uh, he wisely and beautifully chooses which ones to implement, in what sense are those infinite ideas real? They're in the mind of God. They really describe what he can do. They're, they're in his power. You know, maybe, you know, so you've got some fact about how Aleph 3 is bigger than Aleph 2. And then we've got some facts about how God could create a world with Aleph uh, 2 things of one kind, Aleph 3 things of, one kind, of another kind, and some kind of relationships between them where there's a map, which provide a mapping from the Aleph 2 things to the Aleph 3 things. I don't know. But no mapping the, there's no mapping the other way. I don't know. But they're, they're, I think they, they actually do describe something about the power of God, what God can coherently do, is he can create things that match these ideas. Yeah. Would you be willing to say a few more words about your point on, on Gödel and on how that affects their understanding? Of truth? Yeah, so I was thinking this. this. The logicist view is that mathematics is the study not of what is true mathematically, not like facts about numbers, but facts about what can be proved from what. Now, a fact about what can be proved from what is not actually a fact about what is proved from what. So distinguish this. There's like what is proved sort of in the physical sense. I mean physically, like writing down a proof or saying a proof, or maybe even, you know, maybe it's not physical because I don't know if the mind, how much of the mind is the mind and the brain and what's physical and what's not. It's hard, but it might be in the mind. But anyway, it's like real concrete proof that's uh, embodied in writing, m thinking, or speaking. That's one thing, but that's not, what I think the theory is, the theory is that the, the logicist theory is the mathematics about what can be proved. Now, claims about what can be proved, well, what can be proved means to say that something can be proved is to say that there's a certain kind of abstract mathematical object called a proof, where a proof is a sequence of, uh, uh, is a sequence of symbols obeying certain kinds of uh, rules. And so to say that something can be proved from something means there's a certain string of symbols, abstract string of symbols, which maybe nobody has ever written down and nobody ever will write down, where at the beginning we have these axioms, at the end we have this conclusion, and all the rules are followed. Well, the string of symbols is you know, an abstract mathematical object just as much as a number is. And Gettle's insight was, in fact, you can code all of these things as numbers. And so really the claim that, something, that there is a proof of something is a claim that there's a certain kind of number. And that it can't be proved is a claim that a certain kind of number doesn't exist. And uh, all, kinds of, all the kinds of philosophical puzzles about things that are, cannot be proved but are nonetheless true, you, might, you, you come back to at the level of proofs where you might have some claim where something in fact cannot be proved but you cannot prove that it cannot be proved. 
And so, yeah, I think in the end, this, this concept of provability is just as uh, sort of far away from the concrete and just as mysterious as, this con as the concept of a number and has very much a very similar logical structure. Yeah. Um, I guess on the on the, on the idea with um, ugly math that perhaps there isn't a uh, we haven't figured out the beauty behind it yet. Do you think? Are, are you talking about we have like our our math hasn't progressed to that point yet, or do you think maybe our like language of math could be insufficient to find the beauty? Like this is because I, I guess like there is we're saying that there's like a there's a a, a logic that is God's power, um, but our the math we have created is a language to try to describe that logic, right? Or is, is that is it, am, I, am I following that? Correctly? Yeah, yeah. So is, is is there a way we could our our language of math could be too limited to describe some of the out there. That's a great suggestion. You were asking me which of these two is mine. I, and neither, because I, I hadn't thought about it as oh. interestingly as you've just suggested. Yeah, no, I think that's both our possibilities. And a third possibility is that our aesthetic sensibilities may be deficient to some degree. So I remember some claim made from some about sort of in the context of Eastern mysticism that you have like not achieved enlightenment if you cannot see the beauty in a roadkill cat. <laughs> and in a way, I'm kind of horrified of, of seeing beauty in it, but, but maybe there's something to that, uh, to, to that kind of insight, that there is like a beauty throughout the world and that we are blind, uh, that, that we are blind to. So yeah, maybe we, maybe we need more like, so three options. We need, maybe we need mathematical connections between different areas that would reveal the beauty. Maybe we need a new kind of mathematical language. Or maybe we are not sufficiently appreciative of certain kinds of beauty in the way that I am not appreciative of the beauty of music, even though I know on the testimony of other people I trust that music is, in fact, uh, beautiful and that I'm missing out on something. I think I was told we should finish at 8.30, and it's 8.33, but if, <laughs> if, but there may be some chance for people to talk one-on-one uh, -on -one if afterwards is. Um, yeah, maybe for a few minutes, um, but for now, let's give uh, Professor... Uh, <laughs>